Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Let's quickly write down some brief thoughts about leadership, and then I'm going to define leadership for you. Seven principles that I mentioned last night, I want to open with them in this session. And the first principle of true leadership sounds very simple, but yet it's very challenging. And that is true leadership is the inherent reality of the human spirit. It is built into us. True leadership is inherent in the human spirit. And what that means is that every human being has built into his or her spirit the capacity to lead. Everybody does. Now, whether they become that or execute that or whether they experience that inherent leadership potential is up to a number of factors. One of the major ones is environment. Because we become what our environment dictates to us. And so having the spirit of leadership, or should I say the leadership spirit built into you, does not guarantee that you shall become that leader. Principle number two, true leadership cannot be taught. It must be discovered. Another important principle to remember. Uh, all the Leadership seminars in the world cannot make you a leader. Because if it could, we'd have more competent leaders around us. We got colleges and institutes that train people in leadership. And then when they graduate, they are followers. Leadership is something that happens to you because it's already present, but it's buried within you. Principle number three, true leadership is self-discovery. What we mean by that is a leader is born when you discover yourself the truth about yourself, the essence about your true nature and your capabilities, your true potential. That is why, and I want to make this point very clear, that is why the greatest leaders in history that we perceive as leaders were normally products of crisis. Because they were placed in circumstances or under conditions that drew on abilities they never knew they had. It was always there, but they discovered some things about themselves in the midst of the pressure that they didn't know they had. And that is why some of the greatest leaders in history were born in the furnace of crisis. Many times, and probably most times, the creator will allow you to enter crisis to reveal yourself. And if you study the text of scripture, you will find this to be true in the lives of most of the people that we admire as great leaders in scripture. 
if you study them, it was crisis that revealed them. In other words, every David needs a Goliath. And so leadership is self-discovery. Principle number four, true leadership is serving your gift to the world. We tried to make this clear the last two days, that leadership is a matter of discovering what you were supposed to serve to the world. And then the conditions that you are placed in that make demands on that gift. Everybody in this building and watching this DVD, listening to this CD, everybody that exists have a market waiting for them. There's an audience that was born to receive your gift. And you've got to believe that. I was shocked when I discovered how big my market was. And when I compare where I was born to who are seeking me today, it doesn't add up. I believe that it's impossible for you to find your market without stepping out in faith. You have to be willing to lose everything to gain everything. Sometimes we call situations uh, tragedy, crisis, but in God's program, they were promotions. If some things never happened, you would never be doing what you're doing. Greenwood is a product of a crisis. I rest my case. Nothing is more dangerous to progress than comfort. And that is why the greatest wealth always comes from bankruptcy. What gift are you supposed to serve to the world? You know, you have to lose everything before you gain everything. I, in my book, Becoming a Leader, please, everyone get a copy of this book. I just can't stress it. I'm leaving you in a few hours, so I'm going to leave my book with you. Because I'm in my book, so you can get me. This book, I, 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 I talk about something that people keep missing. And that is, you can never be totally accepted until you've been completely rejected. The reason why many people don't achieve their true leadership ability is because they are seeking the approval of everybody. They want to be liked. If you are an original, you are an irritation. <laughs> the very nature of originality means that you have no duplicate anywhere. You automatically become sus a suspect. Because we've never seen you before. And that's why most of us would prefer to be copies. So we can be liked. Number five, true leadership is self-deployment. Uh, this is a simple statement, but it's not easy. Uh, to deploy yourself means that you discover what you're supposed to deliver to the world and you distribute it. I'm working on a new book that's going to come out next year. It's going to take that long to write it. 
And it's really called The Power of Servant Leadership. In that book, we're going to talk about some heavy stuff about the reality of what it is to serve yourself to the world. Because that's what's missing in the world. Deploying yourself is frightening. But it's necessary. And sometimes God blesses you with a good job. Because in that context, he wants you to deploy yourself. It's good to work for a company, for a church, for an educational system. It's good. Because in that situation, God has given you that privilege to deploy yourself. I believe that none of us should really be employed. I believe we should all be deployed. In essence, if you've been hired to work in a company, you need to turn that position into your own business. Treat it as if it's your business. And what I'm teaching concerning leadership is not an encouragement for you to abandon your ministry or abandon the church or abandon the business you're in or abandon the company. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you finding an opportunity to deliver your gift to that organization and deploy yourself there. You see, I am too valuable to be employed. So if I work for your company, I'm working for myself. I'm just deploying my gift within the context of your organization or your vision. That's all. And that's what God intended. He intended for every joint to supply. To build up the whole. That's what leadership is. Let me give you another example. Number six. True leadership is self-manifestation. A leader is someone who is so busy manifesting themselves, they have no time to prove themselves. You know, some people live to prove themselves to other people. That's a problem. You ain't got nothing to prove. Just be yourself. What a tragedy to live the rest of your life having to prove yourself to your parents or to your ex-husband or to your girlfriend who left you or your boyfriend who jilted you. To you, you are too smart to live your life proving yourself to people. Get busy manifesting yourself to the world. Number seven, true leadership is self-exposure. True leadership is showing us who you really are. True leadership is, is becoming everything he first thought of when he created you. God had an idea that made you necessary. <laughs> There's something God wanted done that required your presence. So he created you to manifest it. And that's what leadership is born from. It is born from exposing that self that God intended. Now Moses was designed to be a deliverer. Born to be a deliverer. Matter of fact, that's why they, the Lord made his mother and father name him Moses. Moshe is the Hebrew word actually means through the waters. Heavy stuff. <laughs> I wonder what your true name is. Not the one your father gave you. The one God had in mind. What is your true name? Can we expose your true name? What is your true name? You know, Jesus changed names of certain people because the name wasn't right. 
I wish I had time to talk to you about that because that's a very heavy principle there. It's a very important principle. See, you're, you're, you, you always got two names. The one your parents gave you and the one God had in mind. And by the way, in Hebrew, the name of a thing is the thing. And that's why God did not allow Mary and Joseph to name Jesus. <laughs> God provided the name himself. You shall call his name Yeshua. Why? For he shall save people. See, he was named what he was. What is your true name? By the way, you should never build your confidence on your last name. You need to live in such a way that your first name is enough. Study the Bible. We don't know anybody's last name. This is too much for you. I can't talk about it. People who have not found their true self need a lot of titles. The more titles you need, the less effective you are. That's why you need titles. <laughs> the more effective you become, the less names you need. So if I got to call you the right honorable bishop, holy, righteous, <laughs> prophet, evangelist, man or woman of God, that is proof that you don't know what you're doing. I want you to think about it. That's why I back away from all these titles, people. Are, you know, when you say oral, now there are a lot of guys named oral in the world. But when you say oral, you need to live so effectively that your first name is enough. Expose yourself. I don't blame you. I'd laugh too. You never had this Bishop Moses. Doesn't need it. <laughs> Reverend Ezekiel. Doesn't need it. Prophet Paul. Doesn't need it. Evangelist Jesus doesn't need it. So why are people so caught up in all of these pursuit of titles? It's because they haven't lived effectively enough yet to lose them. A lady said to me one day, she says, Every time I think of miles, I think of purpose. I said, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. On my first name to be enough. On my tombstone, all I want is miles. That's all I want. One guy lived so well. All they put on his grave is J F K. Not even a name. Leadership is exposing your true self. What is leadership? Let's define it. Now, it took me a while to, de to, to develop this definition, so please take a note of it, write it down. It took me a long time to define leadership. I have a lot of books that I've read on leadership, hundreds of books, I guess, over the years. I have a lot of definitions that I have kept in my files. 
I read everybody that writes on leadership. I always read, read four books a month is my goal. Because true leaders should be reading all the time. So if you're going to be a leader, young lady, you've got to read. Shut the TV off and read. No matter how old you are, start reading again. Do you know why your brain actually becomes senile? You stop using it. Do you know your brain is a muscle? Did you know that? It's a muscle. <laughs> it's the largest muscle in your body. It's just like a muscle. And you, 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 your brain actually develops by use. The more you use it, the more it develops. That's why you're losing your mind, because you stop reading. New information exercises the brain. Say it with me. That's what keeps me sharp. I keep putting in new information. Constantly reading. The Apostle Paul was a great leader because he was a reader. When Paul was put in prison, Paul didn't ask for food. He didn't ask for toothpaste. The guy didn't ask for water. He said, Timothy, when you come, bring my books. That's in your Bible. What do you do when you have downtime? Do what Paul did. Read. When they put you in prison, what do you do? Read. You stuck on a bus stop? Read. Wait in an airport? Don't waste time. Expand your mind. Read. And so I read, and I keep reading, and I'm still reading, and I've been trying to find, how do you define leadership? I've read Peter Drucker, and I've read all these guys, and I studied them, I went to college, I got a degree, and all this stuff, and I still couldn't find one definition that integrated all the components of leadership that the Bible teaches. And so I wrote my own. Now they're quoting me, praise the Lord. Here's my definition of leadership. It's very complicated. Leadership is the capacity to influence others through inspiration generated by a passion, motivated by a vision, which is birthed by a conviction that is produced by a purpose. Oh, Lord is right. Can you read it one more time? Make sure buy this CD and let it enter your spirit. Leadership is what? The capacity to influence others through inspiration. Motivated by a passion. Generated by a vision. Birthed by a conviction from a purpose that you have. In other words, leadership is your capacity to influence people through inspiring them. How do you inspire them? Because you have a passion for something. What's your passion for? There's a vision you see of your life. Where'd the vision come from? It comes from a conviction, a belief that you have. And that belief comes from a sense of purpose that you develop when you connect with your creator. Let me put it another way. If in this sentence is everything you need to become a leader, everything is there. I, I mean, I had to craft it to get it right. If you want to become a true leader, I'm talking to you, every one of you, you've got to turn that whole thing upside down and start from the bottom. Let me put it another way. First, you need to discover your purpose. What is purpose? Your reason for existence. You've got to find out or discover a reason why you exist. If you don't know why you are here, you cannot be a leader. There has to be a sense of meaning for your life, a, a sense of assignment, a sense of contribution to the destiny of the world.
And then the purpose will produce a conviction. A conviction is you believe that you were born to do something in the world. That conviction is important. Because when you ignite the conviction that you have a purpose for living, then it produces a vision. You begin to see yourself doing it. You imagine it. You begin to see pictures of it in your mind of what you could do to fulfill it. You start dreaming as a child, as a teenager. You begin to see yourself, I could do that. I'd like to do that. I wish I could do that. I'd like to see that happen. You begin to dream. That's why the vision is important. Because once you begin to picture the vision, then comes something that's the key. And it's passion. The reason why people are followers is because they have no passion. Now, passion is right in the middle because passion is the key to the next important issue, and that is your passion will produce inspiration in people. You cannot lead who you do not inspire. Now, watch this. If you cannot inspire people, you have to manipulate them. Haha. <laughs> 90% of the people that you call leaders are simply professional manipulators. They are experts in playing with people's emotions. And they got titles. We call them doctors, reverends, bishops, pastors. We call them all kinds of names. But they are manipulators. Whenever you manipulate a people, you cease being a leader. You become a dictator. True leaders do not control people. They inspire them. So the most important ingredient in leadership is inspiration. So what you've got to do to become an effective person on earth is to find out where does inspiration come from? How do you produce it? And the answer is on the list. It's passion. When you meet someone who is passionate for something, it affects you. That's why true leaders, listen carefully, son, have not found something to live for. They found something to die for. The reason why no one's following you right now <laughs> is because you are so busy trying to make a living. You haven't found something to die for. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said it's so wonderful. The guy is awesome. He said, he said, look. He's telling his disciples now. He said, look, if you want to be effective in the world, here's the key, he says. If you seek your life, you lose your essence of effectiveness. If you are so busy trying to survive, trying to pay mortgages, trying to make a living, make ends meet, he says, if that's your purpose for living, we won't even remember you after you're gone. You're so busy looking for your life, you lose your life. But then he says, if you lose your life, find something that you lose your life on. See, when you find something that you are willing to be called a fool over, you are going where? To move your church where? Establish it where? And you're going to
going to live where? Found something to lose. It's like four. You can't succeed until they call you a fool. God sent me here. You better listen to me. You going to work with him? You could be doing so much more. Found something to lose your life for. That's why very few people become great leaders. I always tell the story of Martin Luther King, Jr. Boy, what a guy. Many of you listen to Martin Luther King's speeches, and you think that the greatest speech he gave was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, which is not true. But that's the only one you remember. I had a dream. That's the only one you remember. That's not what made him a leader. He became a leader when he made a speech that no one heard publicly, except in a small little church in Alabama one night. Before he went out to the meeting, someone threw a rock in his window with a note tied to it, almost killed his kids. And the rock said, if you come out tonight, we'll kill you. They heard he was going to be speaking at this little church in Alabama. And so his enemies intimidated him and said, if you come out tonight, we will kill you. His wife broke down in tears, and she said, my honey, you can't go tonight. You know they mean that, and I can't afford to be a widow. These kids need a father. You, gotta, you just you can't do that. Martin said to his wife, honey, I have to do this. Let me tell you something. You will never become a leader until you find something you have to do. I have to do this. She said, why? He said, because no one else can do it. Have you found something that no one else can do? See, he was making speeches in his house. That was making him a great leader. And he left the house that night under heavy guard. They took him to the church. The story goes that he, put, he mounted the pulpit. Small little church, a few hundred people. They were sitting in the windows and all over the rafters and everything. And he stood there that night, and he made the greatest speech of leadership. He said, I don't know if I'm going to make it home because they threatened me. They said if I come out tonight, they're going to kill me. But I'm here. And I guess they could kill me, and they probably will. But it doesn't matter anymore. See, you're not a leader until it doesn't matter anymore. See, the problem with most people is it matters. Stop protecting yourself and obey God. Lose your life for my sake, he says, and you will gain your life. They won't be able to rub you out of history. They'll name roads after you. We can't get rid of a dead man. He's everywhere. He lives. So you think death gets rid of you. How long will all Roberts live after he dies? Can you handle the criticism he went through? They killed him a long time ago. But it didn't matter anymore. 
God told me to build this university in the middle of a farm field. He's crazy. Try to get rid of his name. See, you're too dignified to be a leader, man. You want to be respected by people who ain't doing nothing. Hey, boy, say passion. passion. Don't find something to live for anymore. You're too old for that. Find something to die for the next couple of years. Ask God to show you an assignment that's worth dying for. Find an assignment that's bigger than your salary. Leadership comes from passion. Do you know what made Jesus Christ such an awesome leader? Let me give you an example. His first meeting with his disciples, go back and read it. First meeting, he called them young guys, very fresh, you know, they were green behind the ear, <laughs> young guys. And his first meeting with them went like this. He had one agenda in the meeting. The agenda was one item, death. That's heavy. His first meeting was simple. The Bible says he called them together, and he began to tell them, I will be delivered into the hands of evil men, and they shall kill me. I shall be crucified. Wait a minute, man. We're just getting the company started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you missed the point. He started out by telling them, I am willing to die for this vision. Now let's get started. See, everybody's looking for protection, safety, survival, security. But true leaders lose their lives before they die. Oh, let me say it again. They lose their lives before they die. So you can't kill a dead man with criticism. He's already dead. Let me tell you how to measure your passion. What hurts your feelings? How do you respond to criticism? That measures your passion. How do you respond to threats from people? That measures your passion. See, Martin Luther King Jr., he was dead that night. He said, it doesn't matter anymore. See, you can't kill a dead man. He died that night. Are you dead yet? <laughs> That's the question. You know me, I'm already dead. I'm telling you, I'm dead. I will build the most effective leadership training institute in the world. That's what I'm going to do. I don't care what you believe about that or what you think about me. I'm dead. You criticize me. It doesn't matter. You can't. Dead men don't respond. Everybody's inspiration. And that's what inspires people. When you have a passion for something to the point of death, it inspires them. That's what makes them look for you. And then the inspiration brings influence. You cannot influence who you cannot inspire. Inspiration is not control. Because inspiration is in the hands of the one who's inspired. <laughs> I look at you, and I fall in love with your passion. So I submit to you my gifts. And say, I want to help you do that. 
That's why I always tell you this whole week that true leaders do not seek followers. Followers seek true leaders. They pursue the passion. When you cease being passionate about what you are doing, you will lose people. Just remember that. Because people will come to you because of your passion. What made half a million people march from Montgomery, Alabama to Washington, D.C.? A dead man did. He was already dead. When you influence people, then, they call you a leader. This is very important, very, very kind of complicated here. See, you don't, leadership is a privilege the followers give you. <laughs> they call you leader. True leaders do not seek leadership. Why? They're too busy pursuing a passion. It's the people that come and follow the passion that when they look back, they realize they got followers. <laughs> and then they start calling you our leader. Our leader. <laughs> All true leaders are reluctant leaders. I hope you're getting this stuff. This is heavy. Get this CD. Listen to it ten times. I'm telling you. See, you, the, the biblical concept is so different from the world. Because a reluctant leader is one who is possessed by a passion. He's not looking for people. He's pursuing an assignment. And it's that pursuit that attracts the people. Are you passionate about your job? Or do you hate Monday mornings? <laughs> if you're in charge of a department and you have no passion for that department, then all the people in that department are going to have a low morale. That's why managers and assistant pastors got have the same passion for the vision as the leader. Because they affect the people by their passion or lack of it. So when you lose passion for the vision of an organization, it's time to leave. Because now you become an infection. Instead of inspiring, you infect. And it becomes an evil. That's when you start disagreeing with the leader. It's called division. Two visions in the same house. And Christ said, I can't stand. So the minute you begin to lose a passion... For the company's vision, for the church's vision, you're in trouble. And the company is in danger. You remember when Peter was in the meeting with Jesus, had a board meeting going on, and he began to tell him about what he's going to do with the company. He said, look, I'm going to be killed. He starts this thing again, you know, I'm going to be off in the hands of sinful men. They're going to crucify me, and I'll be buried, and I'll rose the third day, and all this stuff, you know. And, and his... His assistant pastor held up his hand and said, excuse me, sir, I disagree with you. He didn't allow him to finish the sentence. 
He said, get out. You are full of the devil. He didn't discuss it. There was no negotiation. There was no time of counseling. He just said, get out. Why? Because if you allow dissension, it becomes an infection. Companies are not destroyed by external enemies. Neither are churches. David says, I wish it were my enemies that killed me, that stopped me. He said, but it wasn't my enemies. <laughs> it was those right in the board meeting who lost the passion for the vision. So now they are no longer inspiring people. They are infecting people. Leadership must inspire to influence. And you cannot lead who you cannot influence. Praise the Lord. Is this good stuff? Yeah. You're all sure quiet today. So, if you are going to become a great leader, you must first begin with number one. Don't look for title. Look for purpose. It is my desire to help people all over the world discover their purpose. Because if I can help you discover your purpose, you are on the journey to becoming a leader. Because you found something that gives you conviction in life. And the average person in the world has no conviction. All they have is a career. Find a conviction for your life. Conviction means discovering something you must do. I have to do this. I will die if I don't do this. When you come to that point, and God begins to show you that thing in pictures. We call it vision. Do you see yourself? You know, talk, you, need to, you need to go sit down and dream a little bit. See where you want to be. I'm going to say it again. See where you want to be. Take a tour of where you want to be. Walk into the buildings where you want to be and see the crowd. Whatever it is, be there for a while. God is so wise. God say, Abraham, you live in the valley, in the plains of Ur. And I can't use you down here because you can't see beyond the mountains. So leave your father. Come up to the mountain with me. I want you to see Farther than your eyes can look. Take a tour of your future. And that's what Abraham did. He saw a land. And when he saw the land, then God says, now stop looking forward and look up. See, you got you to look two places. <laughs> you got to see how far you want to go. And then you got to see how much you want to achieve. He said, look at the stars. Can you count them? No. He said, that's how much I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you what you can't count. Anybody ready for what you can't count? I say, anybody ready for what you can't count? Are you ready for what you can't count? God wants this church to be so big you can't count it. He wants you to be so wealthy you lost count of your money. Are you ready for what you can't count, I said. He said, now, Abraham, we can talk about the future now because you already saw something bigger than where you are. 
he showed him a vision of his future. My prayer is that you would take this to heart. Let me close with a, what I call the three, the, the three keys of leadership success. Three simple keys. Number one, purpose. You have to discover the original reason for your existence. Number two, potential. You must be convinced that your ability to fulfill that purpose is already in you. It's inherent. You've got to be convinced of that. God will never demand from you what he didn't supply. God doesn't ask birds to fly without putting flight in the bird. So your potential is equal to your purpose. Your ability is equal to your responsibility. That is why you should never allow anyone to measure your ability. Because most of them don't like you. <laughs> so they would always measure it less than theirs. I'm going to say this again. Potential is equal to purpose. So if you want to know what you can do, discover what you were born to do. That's why I write some, wrote so many books on potential. Because people don't understand that potential is not something that you go look for. It's already there. And by the way, uh, let me just put this in before we wrap up here. Uh, if you attempt to do something that you were not born to do, the ability is not present. So it's like a horse trying to fly. <laughs> That's why it's important for you to discover your purpose so you don't frustrate yourself. Burnout is someone attempting to do what they weren't born to do. We call it burnout. I call it foolishness. <laughs> When you find what you were born to do, you become so excited about it, you actually get energy from it, not depression. Your strength comes from your assignment. Glory, hallelujah. I'm telling you, if you discover your purpose, you discover your potential. But the last one is important, most important, and it's principles. If you're going to fulfill your self-discovery, you have to live according to laws that regulate function. Principles protect potential and purpose. Oh, boy. This is so important. Say that with me. Principles... Protect, protect potential, potential and purpose. purpose. No matter how great your purpose is, and no matter how much potential you possess, if you violate principles, it'll destroy both. Yeah. It's like a talented artist who becomes an alcoholic. So many of my friends who I grew up with in school, I look at them today, they look 10 years, 20 years older than I am, drug addicts. And they were so intelligent in class. These were mathematicians. I mean, young men who had such great capability and talent, but they violated the principle of their bodies, <laughs> destroyed their purpose, canceled their potential. Now they're living under bridges. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So don't get too carried away with purpose and potential. 
be sure that you follow God's word and his laws. How many of your friends that you know have great futures, but they're drug addicts today? You know them. You know they were smart, but they violated laws. The laws of health, the laws of self-control, the laws of, of the safety of obedience to law. So when God says, thou shalt not fornicate, why did he tell you that? To try and protect your purpose and potential. God tells you, don't marry this person. He convicts you in your spirit. You violate God's word. And you marry someone who destroys your future. God tells you, do not steal. Don't take the money from the bank. You are a teller. Don't teach, teach steal the people's money. You try and protect your purpose and potential. God says, do not lie. Do not tell lies. He's trying to protect your purpose and potential. Principles. Your success in your purpose and potential is determined by your willingness to obey principles. Which is what the Bible is. It's simply a book of principles. It's laws. Obey the laws that regulate life. And you will make it to your purpose. In Jesus' name. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.